I am not quite sure where to start introducing my next guest. I can actually celebrate his global achievements and his philanthropic efforts with Dream Mountains. Um, I can mention that he is the eighth person in history to climb all seven summits in under two years. Uh, and that is including Everest, which is unbelievable. It's mind blowing. I can also list off his successful uh, entrepreneurial efforts, retail, real estate, restaurants, uh, and his crazy athletic background, which we're going to get to, which I had no idea. Like there's bull riding and like karate in there. Uh, And in all of this also understand that he spent time and quite a bit of time as a juvie. (laughs) He spent time in jail as a juvenile. And I think it really transformed what you ended up becoming and who you ended up being. So Sean Dawson is joining us on episode 40 of Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, you can always head to extensionmarketing.com. Hi. Hi. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think we will have spent this much time together since we were on the mountain in Kilimanjaro in 2014. I know, and I think you're looking a lot better today than you did then. (laughs) I was so sick. She did great, folks. Sincerely, I, I, she did great. I it's summited, not an easy trek to begin with. It so. is not, and and uh, yeah, it's not a climb. It's like it's a trek. I was I was so sick, but I I got altitude sickness kind of hit me, and it hit me really early on. Yeah, and like, I mean the yeah. reality was that you you were in fantastic shape for it. It had nothing to do with that. It was altitude, and the the brain has a lot to do with it. Stress has a lot to do with it, and you had a lot of responsibilities to get information back to Canada, and that creates stress even if you recognize it or you don't, but your body does, so. I have to think about it, right? Like yeah. I was kind of climbing with everyone else. Mm-hmm. I was dealing with the altitude because it affected me like on the first night, I was already vomiting. Oh, yeah. uh, and I was sleeping. Yeah, she got the trophy for the first one to I, get sick. <laughs> it was me. Uh, and I was sleeping with my camera pack and my batteries in between my legs to keep them with from two freezing. Other with other roommates. <laughs> like I, you, I do think back on like trying to be able to film it and do it and take the wow, stories and have the, there's, you know, the guys running back down with the video. There was a lot to it, but we're mm-hmm. gonna get to, we're gonna get to that experience yeah. because there's been so many of us who have had the chance uh, to enjoy and be on this lifetime experience mm-hmm. of doing Dream Mountains in a little bit because Dream Mountains is so far, so far off from where you started. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think about the millions that have been raised for charities, and mm-hmm. I look back onto a child who at one point could have gone in a very different direction and was going in a very different direction. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. You're from here? No, I'm from the Brockville. I'm from Brockville, yeah. I am very proud to be from Brockville, although I love my home here in Ottawa, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've been in Ottawa now about 25 years. Okay. So, What was this childhood like? I mean, was it a tight-knit family? What was going on so that you found yourself in juvie? I don't come from any... I mean, I'm... This is all self-inflicted pain. You know, uh, other than a young, divorced... Uh, situation. You know, my parents were divorced by the time I was 10. Um, but I mean, you know, my parents are, are wonderful people. I mean, my father's passed away, but my parents were great. It wasn't anything really, you know, uh, about that. I just chose to get involved with the wrong people. Uh, I chose to let attitude and uh, anger and stuff get in the way. And um, and then that really opened up doors to get in, in with the wrong situations and uh, and get myself into trouble. But at the same point, it's probably the same strength that got me into trouble, that got me out of trouble. Okay, how old are you at this point? Um, I spent, uh, I was 14 to 16 when I, was, when I was in juvenile. So at 14, oh my gosh, Andy's Andy's 13 right now. So I'm looking at the kids that she's hanging out with. So grade when I was 13, eight. Yes. I ran away from home. And when I say I ran away from home, I ran away from Edmonton all the way down to Arizona. On my own at 13. With a backpack, even to the point that I had toilet paper in my backpack so i was well prepared getting ready for mountains 30 no kidding if you're already packing yeah are you kidding you're 13 13 not only that i had t-shirts made back in those days with the glowing letters on the back with a fake name that i had fake id made by one of my street friends so the whole point was to turn myself in eventually in la to authorities never claiming who i am giving them a fake name and then just growing up in la that would have been the deal that's how it was going to work. That was all at 13. Uh, what is the driving for it? Like, are, what are you escaping from? Like, what are you running from at 13? That's a 13? good question. I know. And, it, and to think ahead of that you're going to use this fake name and eventually settle in LA. Technically, I was escaping because I had just been charged with uh, possession and discharge of a firearm. And the police had surrounded my house. My stepfather was actually a police officer. So 
I'm sorry so much for the only embarrassment <laughs> that I caused you. And, um, you know, and then, uh, like, I was I was in their custody. I was in his custody. And it would have been a situation where I would have been put uh, in juvenile then. So I was kind of getting ahead of the game and starting what I thought was going to be a new chapter in my life. But I can't honestly answer. I don't know what I was escaping from. Like I said, it's not, I didn't, I didn't have bad parents. I wasn't abused. I wasn't, you know, I mean, other than pressure we have and the issues we have with our parents. I mean, I think every child has that. But um, I don't know. I think it was just me just being a rebel without a cause. You made it from Edmonton? There was some to... drugs mixed in with that too at that age. So. Yeah. I, I mean, the fear of how, how our kids are getting to it that early. And that was a long time ago when it wasn't as accessible I as it is now. My, I actually look at my life and my mind sometimes and I look at some kids and I say to myself, you know what, maybe... Maybe the key is just to let them do their thing because I worked stuff out and I turned out okay. So sometimes I give myself hope in that maybe our kids will work be out okay. Good. They're just going to need time. I think this whole generation is just going to need time to find itself. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to get, okay. I'm going to come back to that thought uh, in, in a little bit. Yeah, the mom's thinking um, right well. Uh, well, I'm, well, I'm yeah. thinking because I have a 13-year-old and you made it from Edmonton to See, Arizona. That includes, think about that, that means I had to cross you had a to, border, which included going through a graveyard. So That's you how I got through a border. I, I, there's a there's a, an area that I had found out about that I could actually go through a graveyard that got me through a border. So So you missed the border. You never... No, I went through the border. That's how like, I got into the United States. Right. You, you didn't cross at a border. I wasn't with yeah, a caravan yeah. or anything, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> How Just timely! <laughs> How timely with this with this timing of yeah. this podcast. So, what happens in Arizona? Well, I had had a pen like do, pal. where like do you have money? Do you have not much? I mean, just are, are you again, hitchhiking? I'm sorry, hitchhiking. Arizona is a long way hitchhiking. away. Hitchhiking, hitchhiking, and taking buses. Um, that was the main two routes of transportation. And uh, I had met somebody like. Back in uh, my my grandmother's summer home, kind of idea uh, that lived and she lived in Arizona, been a pen pal, and I literally just showed up at her doorstep, and um, and her folks weren't even home yet. They weren't even home. They had been away for the weekend, and I literally camped in their backyard. Imagine them coming home and they see this kid in their backyard and they're going, "Wait a minute, you're the kid from the summer from the dad? Like what is? How going did on? you end up here? Yeah, and eventually. They knew how to track down my father, who was back in in, uh, in Ontario, and got a hold of him, and never told me. And just all of a sudden, two days later, he showed up at the door, basically to say, "All right, get your yeah. ass ready." You're I kind of home. like the girls' parents. Oh, they were There's cool. A, they I, I cool got to give them some like, credit yeah, there. They were cool. They're just like, well, yeah. all right. And they they gave you two days. <laughs> you had two days <laughs> to enjoy this. Uh, this little, you know, I, I won't even ask about the relationship at this point. You're oh, it 13, wasn't. 14. There was, yeah. yeah, there wasn't anything that way, really. It was just more of a friendship. And it was just uh, somebody I knew that lived far away. And it was a place to go. It was a goal. That was one. That's you remind me of that Leonardo DiCaprio movie when he's always on the run. He's changing. Yeah. He, and he changes... You know, jobs and and all personas is, all those this, skills and because that's you later on down yeah, the line because that really is you you you've you've transitioned yourself through so many different roles in this lifetime so you managed not to get to juvie at that point although you should have no. been end up in arizona it didn't take me long to get dad comes but stepdad comes to get you brings you back home my real father actually oh it was I, your real dad yeah, yeah my real dad he was back home, okay back home, and he was back in ontario okay and then st trouble uh, is just, still around the corner. Yeah, I still have the I still have the drug problem, which creates other problems. Um, I got into, you know, I got into problems in school. Uh, then I got involved with uh, break and entry, uh, back into dealing again. And uh, before I know it, it wasn't very long, and I was I was back in again. So I was back in trouble again, and this time I wasn't getting out. You weren't so. getting out. There was yeah. how long did you spend in juvie? Uh, two years in total, including some of the time was part of a rehab and some of the time was uh, self-inflicted trouble that I got in that extent of my time while I was in time. Where in this the is process? The old system. This is not this is not the current kind of system. This is two acts ago. This is the the old original juvenile act. And uh, so at that time we spent time in like there were like there's technically four different places I went through in the system, uh, but they're like junior prisons back then. 
you know, I think it would change a lot of the way things were if we had those systems still now. I think it would make uh, youth a little bit more accountable in some of their For cases what? now than they are now, in my personal opinion. You're, you're mentioning all of these things, and then you're mentioning that your time is extended because of things that you're doing. So yeah. where, at what point is the trigger that this is not the path of life that you wish to go down? Like, is it, is it well, during juvie? Is it, okay. I met a, uh, inside, the very last place I was in, I uh, was in Cornwall. And uh, I met a ex, um, you know, uh, biker that was a, a one percenter biker that had spent two terms in prison uh, totaling 15 years. And uh, he just took me under his wing. <laughs> it's awesome. Look. He changed your life. Were you anticipating a relationship like this? I... <clears throat> like what? <laughs> that a person who had come from their own difficult background. I mean, you're talking about an individual who has spent 15 years... And well, for, for, for he, him to be able could, to come yeah. out and, and know that he was changing a life, that he had, he was going to have an impact on a young man who was then going to have an impact on the, on a world scale of what you've done in your life. And that's something to, like I said, you know, earlier, you know, if you look back and you go, what can we do? You know, how can we change people? And I, you know, you, you talk about your daughter and geez, she's 13. What could happen? Sometimes just stepping back and just letting them become the, the people they are. Let them make the mistakes because those mistakes, sometimes saving them from a mistake could be what creates a different change. So, I mean, he, I remember a conversation we had had at one point and he said to me, he goes, you know, I think you're going to be successful in whatever you do. The choice is which side of the law do you want to be on? And there's no doubt in his mind I would have been a very successful criminal. Um, but I probably wouldn't be alive at this point, so... This relationship, how long did it? Oh, it he, when I got out of juvenile, one of the things that changed is they changed my high school. They put me from this uh, kind of a blue collared high school into a total prep high school. Shout out to BCI and Brockville. And um, I just not, did not fit in this high school. I was going to say, they had to know you were, oh, did they, they had, had long, to know you were I had coming. Long blonde yeah. hair. I mean, uh, like I, I've never been the kind of person that has fit in any one particular group. Never. Um, but I end up getting a like rookie year of football. I end up um, I end up becoming student council president of the whole school. I had like dope smokers and jocks and all these people that voted for me that didn't even care about student council because I touched a different kind of people. And um, I was the first president of my high school to ever. They tried to impeach me because I didn't pass half my grades, and th there was no <laughs> rule for that. President. <laughs> So they had to right. change the rules after that for that. But I mean, it was it it taught me how to deal with people. But meanwhile, all the way along, every Friday at lunch, my biker friend, Jim Summer, would show up on the season on his motorcycle and take me for lunch to give me a break from trying to live in a world that didn't make sense to me, but not let me dig Go back, back to down. the world yeah. that you thought you could. I even self-inflicted left my family on purpose to to go to foster parents for a year because I knew I needed to be away from everything that could trigger me. So, so I had foster parents for a year, even though my parents were right in the same city. And again, not bad people. I just needed to, I needed to be independent. So, You seek this independence. You have a relationship with this man every Friday, mm -hmm. a reality. And his wife, actually, ironically, his wife turned out to be best friends with my probation officer. So, and his wife was a probation officer. So it was kind of like they sort of, I really had a little group that kind of took care of me and said, we don't want me. <laughs> but they were right because I think they saw, yeah. they saw in you what you were going to become. And I think, I hope they enjoy the success as much of what you have achieved than anybody else. Yeah. I don't, at this point in my life, uh, I've lost touch, so they don't maybe necessarily know. So 100%, but yeah. But it triggered an immediate emotional keep, reaction, I have, Sean. I still, yeah, I still have, uh, I have paperwork from my probation officer. Her name was Alice Mills. I mean, I still remember, but I wouldn't recognize her now in my life, but it would be something that reminds me, you know. There was an article written in The Citizen when I was 20 
that talked about, uh, which was neat because I was from Brafo, so to be written in the Citizen was pretty big news. And I was comparing myself and another young fellow and how we both had done well. But it, it talked about, it was comparing the, it was back when the Young Offenders Act was coming in. So they were taking some comparisons of previous people in the system and then moving forward. And, uh, you know, at that point I was already already managing a bar. I'd lived on my own. I'd never really from 17 on lived at home. So, you know, and I was doing well in, in that industry in Brockville. So. And I'm still in the bar restaurant business, so. Yeah, in between climbing Everest <laughs> yeah. and Killy yeah. and every other uh, summit that there is uh, in the world. Yeah. Were you active? Like, what were the, I mean, because your athletic background through all well, of that's this. That's how so I got into okay. arts. Okay. So I'd, I'd, uh, I'm going to just push this forward a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I had gotten into uh, the, uh, um, the Brockville Rifles, into the militia, as one way to, um, you know, try to straighten myself up. Then I very quickly realized <clears throat> I wasn't good at taking orders, so that didn't. It, it lasted long enough to, you know. But then that was it. Um, and then I got into uh, martial arts and into uh, karate, and uh, within a number of years, I ended up be um, being on Can- Team Canada, and I was on Team Canada for two years. Uh, I placed high, as high as third in the country at, at one point. Um, and that was really good. I mean, the martial arts gave me something to focus on. It, uh, it's so along. disciplined. Oh, it's extremely disciplined. So for right? a, a young man who doesn't like discipline, what was it about the sport that allowed you to stick with it? My choice. What you put into it is what you got out of it. So it was your choice. And, and I set my own goals. Um, and there was support there if I wanted it. And if I didn't want it, then, yeah, you know, it was your choice. Um, and, and my sensei was amazing and his attitude was basically like look I'll, I'll give you I'll be there for you but if you're not going to put in the time in I'm not going to give you the effort so and uh, and I put the time in and he gave me the effort and and I excelled because of it were you competitive like was this was there's an aspect to doing a sport for your own for your for your own yeah. sake right to be able to enjoy the process and the training and then there's those that love to compete and and train to compete where did you fall in the mix? More, it's funny because my girlfriend will tell you I'm the most competitive person she's ever met. The irony about it is I'm not really competitive against other people deep down in my mind. I'm competitive against myself. I'm pushing myself to be the best version of me. So even though I have to beat somebody to win, I'm still self-analyzing what I'm doing all the time. Well, I, I would think you would have to. Uh, what must have what must have gone through your mind at different aspects of any of those climbs that you did in that two years would have been completely self inflicted yeah. within oh, yourself. Yeah. To reach deep down to be able to achieve. And all that, and what that is, I mean, you know, going forward to the climb, uh, you know, specifically, uh, well, actually, all of them had different things to learn from, but. But okay. I mean, even something like Everest, I mean, it took, it was all about trying to dig deep and figure out who you are as a human being, not to try to beat the mountain because the mountain doesn't care and you're not climbing no. the mountain. So. And there are victims, oh. victims to the mountain. Yeah. So when did, oh wait, so you, you get through high school, you go from juvie to the prep school, become class president, become a national karate competitor. <laughs> And meanwhile, uh, I start a career in the, in the bar in the bar, restaurant They're business. in the bar yeah. restaurant business. Yeah. Uh, is it difficult to be around the drinking and what happens in the bar business area and not no, fall and back? No, anybody that knows me, knows me really well, knows that I'm hardcore disciplined. Like I don't, uh, even now it's not even considerable. But even back in my early 20s, I mean, uh, people that can remember me in the bar business, I didn't drink really. Um, or it was one or the other. Or I'd party hard and then be fine. But I didn't. I never allowed myself to lose control. That was the key. The key was about control. It wasn't really the substance didn't matter. The addiction doesn't matter. It was about being able to lose control. If anything, I replaced that with the addiction yes. of staying in control. Because so, trust me, your addiction of being on that these mountains, there's there's something yeah. definitely addictive and as you know, to it. Even with Killy, I mean, the key is discipline. I mean, you know, drink water, Leanne. It's <laughs> it's our little thing. But it's it's just it's like no one's gonna tell you to do it. It's just you've got to do it because if you don't do it, you're gonna reap the benefits or you're gonna reap the the, the you know the well, problems are gonna come the with it. It's difference between so. success and failure. Yeah, especially those that are discipline. success driven. And that's what mountain climbing I, I think uh, brought for me. The it, the interest of it is that discipline. Okay, what was when did you get your first pair of hiking boots? Like at what oh, age then? Because this. we're talking through the twenties. Yeah, like I didn't start when this did that my 40s. start? 
Um, what happened was I, um, so I, I hit like about 40 and I'm thinking, okay, my, my life has been good and it's time to, uh, it's time to give back. So I got involved with Care Canada and uh, I decided to do a climb to Kilimanjaro, same, same situation. And same as most people, it was not easy. It was tough. I had a hard time. Uh, I did, I did better than anybody in my group, but I still had a hard time. So again, my my mind was, you can do better than this. You can you can do this better. And um, I had met uh, a friend of mine had introduced me to our, our first Canadian woman. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, she's a major in our military. Her name is Megan McGrath. And uh, we became friends, and uh, she had climbed Everest. She'd done the Seven Summits. And the idea of the Seven Summits, because Killy being the first one, it's like, all right, well, do you really want to do all of them? And do you realize if you do all of them, that means to get them all done, you have to climb Everest at some point. And um, it sat, I sat on it for a little while, and finally I thought, what the hell? Like, just start it. Just just do one at a time. See how you do. And uh, take it from there and, and see but you already had experienced Kelly to know yeah, and that Kelly, it's not easy. No, and respectfully, uh, Kelly is the easiest by far. I mean, everything else goes into a whole new level. So, yeah. Well, yeah, because Kelly, we're not getting into the ice climbing uh, yeah, and, it's and not, other aspects. It's, it's, it's still high altitude. It's still dealing with those challenges, but it's not technical. So, so then I went to Bolivia. Uh, I spent a month in Bolivia climbing and uh, learning to how train. To, to okay, train. so yeah. you go to so you you finish doing Kili, mm -hmm. kind of do this charity take climb with Caracana. Yeah. You come back to reflect on whether you're going to take on the seven summits because oh, most normal people <laughs> most normal people would say, okay, that was fun. Let's you know in a year or two plan another one. Yeah. You, why this? What was it about saying from one to seven? Because I could do better. I can do it better. I can challenge myself. And uh, and it's not just a challenge of fitness. It's a challenge of everything about it, learning it, digging into it, um, changing my life. Because when you make a commitment like the Seven Summits, everything has to change. Like your financial status, it's, you it's know, expensive. It's over $350,000. So where am I going to get that money from? How am I going to keep my businesses alive when I'm away? How am I going to, to just everything, my personal life, everything that was involved at the time. All those things are part of a commitment. So when people sit back and go, well, I could do that. Mm. Sure. How many times people start one year university and go, well, if I had finished. Or I, when I was a black belt, I had so many people, oh, well, I had started martial I, I would have been a black belt by now. But you're not. That's the difference. And that's not a, that's not a judgment on people. It's the true. point is, the bottom line is you either do it or you talk about it. But it's up to you. And, and I don't care how I compete against other people or how I stand. It's my version of who I am inside. I know who I am inside, and I know what I can handle, and I know I'm my own limitation. So, so you go to Bolivia. Uh, we go to Bolivia, and you start to train. Yeah. For th and so it's ice climbing. Like, is it learning it's how a, to do it's everything? What? It's cramping. And are you training, it's ice like training, okay? It's do you have a coach? Do you have? Oh yeah, it's full. Like I mean, yeah, no, you're not doing this on your own. Trained. Okay. Yeah. And. Uh, so I, I'm I sorry, up, Veronica. Yeah. Veronica is sending me like little messages through the glass. Okay, <laughs> got you. She's cut live, she says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna get to. Oh, yeah, I'll eventually get over <laughs> and, and and let people know how to find the podcast. Okay, yeah. Are you finding it this interesting yeah. though? Is it yeah. interesting? <laughs> oh, you can't. I can't wait till we get to the seven summits here. Like this is insane. Okay, so we're in Bolivia. You so I end got up. Uh, yeah, I'm. 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 I'm training uh, with an amazing company out of Seattle, actually called Mountain Madness, uh, which later has a, a reference to uh, Everest. But anyways, I trained with them, and um, and through my training, I eventually climbed the the highest mountain in Bolivia, which was twenty one thousand feet, so higher higher than than, than Kili, than Kili, but f extremely technical. Um, and uh, my point to myself was, if I can handle this, if I can do this, then I will continue. <laughs> and go on to Denali. The problem with the mountains is you can't just, you have to choose them based on times of the year. So the next one would be Denali, which is not the easiest next one. It's just the right one if I'm gonna keep on going. At this time of year. Exactly. In and an I effort was to do the, in, and the two years. My brain, literally, I got home from one month in Bolivia and 11 days later headed to uh, Alaska. And that's what, I wasn't trying to do this all under a time period. It doesn't how it started. It was about keep going. 
everything is in line. Your brains, like your mind, your your goals are in line. Don't stop. Just keep going. And it was like as long as each one is accomplished, then you make the decision on the next one. And that's exactly how it played out. You come home from Bolivia. You take 11 days, repack, refuel, and go to So that Denali is in Alaska. Yeah. And what is the challenge? What is that mountain known for? Well, it's, I mean, it's the highest mountain in North America. Mm -hmm. So when we think of the Rockies and we think of anything, I mean, even Logan, which is our highest mountain in Canada, but um, it's higher. So, and it's technical. Um, it has a 50% success rate. Um, it's, it's technically, tw you know, uh, just under 21,000 feet, but because of its proximity to the Arctic Circle, um, it has the illusion of being closer to 23, 24,000 feet is the feeling of it. Uh, it was a challenging one. It was the first time I had come close to uh, the experience of, of fatal. Um, I had uh, on the very last day coming back, I'd lost my footing through an ice bridge and uh, had to secure myself on an edge, um, on a wall edge, and have my teammates work with getting me back up. Had to cut my sled loose. Um, so it are was you? Like, is there a sense that you think you might die? Oh, it was. Yeah, it was guaranteed. It was. It was two hundred foot drop that I, I got myself into the side of the of the wall. So we got so you're holding on how? Uh, with my crampons dug in and my ice axe and waiting for my teammate to, to hopefully grab my line and pull me up and secure my line with me. So you're pretty much on, a, on a mountain edge. Sled. I had a 60 pound sled behind me. You have to cut it? Behind me. Yeah, so I it's cut. cut. It was, it's pulling me. So You got your ice pick on <laughs> one hand and your two feet dug yep. into whatever into part the of the, into the yep. ice. Yep. And yeah, and then how work long with my teammates you, to pull me up. How long did it, first of all, it must have felt like forever. It felt like forever. I, probably the whole process was two minutes, but it felt like forever, kind of like, because it just happened out of nowhere. Everybody else had just crossed right in front of me. I wasn't even, and it taught me another lesson to never get, allow myself to get out of the moment because I was just taking it for granted. We were on our very last day. We'd just gone, but the weather had changed because it was getting warmer and now the crevasses were loosening up and uh, just it just caught me right off guard. So again, it taught me from that point on for the future, including Everest, never never take my eye off the ball. In that end, as long as I'm, until I'm safe, don't stop thinking about it. When people have flashes of seeing their life flash before them. I've had it a lot. Yeah, because of my previous life, I've had, I'm, I've had a gun to my head three times in my life, so I've had things actually happen that I'm going okay. I, I don't, uh, I don't think I've ever asked this question. To compare having a gun, <laughs> you know, pointed at you, and to compare, you know, to be in that life-threatening of a situation, that's based on on. I'm looking at someone's anger, someone's revenge. Something is happening in that moment. To mm -hmm. the thought of your life flashing before you, stuck on a mountain in Alaska on an ice ridge. What what difference? Like, is there a comparison between the two realities? No. The two I mean, life circumstances are, are so... Me as a person, each... You know, all my life experiences all add up to different equations of how to deal with stress. No different than, you know, the earthquake and uh, that the team dealt with. You know, a lot of those people would probably tell you that I was, you know, almost to the point of being robotic about how I dealt with stuff in the team. But my brain just goes into a certain place by this point in my life and of how to deal with that kind of stress. Versus, you know, something like someone cuts me off in the road. I mean, I'm still going to yell at them too and you know, lose my, you know, shit with them. But, but it's a different kind of thing. There's a difference between knowing what's just, day-to-day -day stuff versus okay immediately this is a lifetime this is a life-threatening situation mm -hmm. immediately get yourself that place so i know also i don't freeze i know who i am we all like to think we we know what we would do in a situation i truly know what i'll do in a situation so i'm um, <laughs> well you throw you threw so much out there right there 
so stop asking questions no i'm fascinated by this okay what i am going to do though is i do we have to, to press yeah off, i'm yeah. like i have to we got to keep one. you guys wanting to come to the podcast <laughs> how's this as a leader living your life with leanne lang yep. uh Loving for it. those of you that are just listening to the podcast i'm going to shut off the mm. um the facebook live these all come in uh every thursday i release them uh this is kind of the stories that we are looking at and the people that we are covering here on the podcast veronica's sneaking in i think i'm going to do a couple of these facebook live so people kind of get a feel as to uh, as to uh, the topic. Um, someone just asked us really close, who is he? Sean Dawson uh, is my guest today. Uh, he has uh, climbed all seven summits, uh, done so in less than two years, the eighth person to be able to do that. And he is the founder of Dream Mountains, who has raised millions of dollars and has had so many, how many, like hundreds of people climb under him. Yeah, we've had, I think our last count was about 110 people. 110, in including there. me, uh, be part of his charity climbs that have, that have been uh, around the world. So, so you come back down in Alaska having had mm -hmm. this experience yeah well actually in that that particular trip um, yeah a few things neat like again every mountain people always ask me the same questions what was your favorite what would you whatever every mountain taught me something different that one was again about paying attention but that mountain was tough because pound for pound I would put it right up against Everest because we were it's not nearly as long it's it's different things but we're carrying 60 pounds on our back and pulling 40 in a sled. We're self, the team is self-sufficient. There's no support, there's no porters, there's no Sherpa, there's no, the team is doing everything. We're, we're setting up our own camps. We're digging into the ice. Like we had to dig down to create a what place. What are temperatures to, like? Oh, it's cold. It's cold. And we got caught in a couple of snowstorms. Uh, we got caught in a snowstorm at high camp, which was, uh, it stranded us for like two to three days. All of a sudden now we're three people in a tent but fully leaving in the tent, not just partially sleeping in, in the gear. Everything was in there. Uh, I can't stand Roman noodles, numeral, uh, noodles anymore because that's all we had. Um, you're 24 hour, pretty much 24 hour sunlight. So sleeping in this situation is and difficult. You're, and you're depleted and exhausted, oh, right? Yeah. yeah, you're pushing it. It's um, It was, again, it was that everything just keeps oh. leading to getting better at each, the next climb. How long was that climb? From that one's only uh, less than three weeks. Yeah, about two and a half weeks. Wow. So, uh, but it's, you know, you fly onto the glacier um, and then you start and then you again get to just at the end and then you fly off the glacier and then you're back, you're safe. So, you know, once you're in that plane or at least once you've landed in that plane that you're back to safe and you're, you're good, you're back in Alaska and just go enjoy Alaska kind of thing. So, wow. You come home, do you tell people about the experience? Do you tell people about hanging off of a, a rock, you know, an ice edge and not it, uh, it, it, only, does it become part only of the story? if it gets, yeah, it just becomes, you know, it's funny because, you know, as we're going to talk and as you said, you learned things about me, I, I just, the way my life has been no different than that. I just, I experience life. Mm -hmm. So most you know, people I'm, don't experience life like this, Sean. Yeah. They live in the a, thing is, so you, you so meet me at a party and we get yeah. talking and you talk with the bull ride and I'm like, oh yeah, I used to be a bull. I used to bull ride. Or, oh, yeah, I used to climb yeah. Everest. I, I've climbed Everest. People look at me and go, who's this drunk Who guy here? Is like, this who's guy? this guy? And, and to be honest with you, I've had that reaction with you. Like when oh. I'll say, oh, with Sean Dawson. And I'm like, no, no, he did Everest. He did that. And people are like, yeah, okay. Right. And exactly. I'm like, no, actually, really. He's in our backyard and he's done all of these things. Because my mind is just simply looking at the next thing. And, and I don't kind of live in the past of everything it's not that i don't i love everything but i know what it's done to me i know how it changes me and human being i just want to get on to the next whatever life mm -hmm. adventure that is and i'm not a generally junkie it's not those kind of adventures it's adventures is whatever the adventure oh, is oh some would say that i mean i mean yeah you're not base cliff jumping Listen, but i'm loving but still i'm loving having you know granddaughters in my life now yeah. that's a great adventure so i mean you know i i could say that's adrenaline sometime with them too <laughs> <laughs> it's as exhausting it's as exhausting it's as climbing fun. okay so you get home from alaska you've now done three then in a time span of five months six well technically so what happens is that's uh, alaska for the record books yeah. becomes the first one okay because bolivia is only training uh Chile, okay. technically Going but you're going to end up story, doing I have to redo you it. You do it. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, well, the first of many times you've done Kili. Yeah. So after Alaska is? Then I go to, um, so the Alaska is in the, uh, as a matter of fact, I spent Canada Day um, on Alaska because I remember taking a picture with one of the most famous mountaineers uh, on Canada Day um, up at uh, base camp in mm -hmm. Alaska. <clears throat> 
so that's how I always remember the time of year that I climbed it. Um, but then I uh, then I have a, a well, break. we're enjoying thirty degree temperatures <laughs> yeah. here, at minus thirty exactly. degrees yeah. on yeah. a nice on yeah. a nice mountain. Okay. And then uh, then I end up going to um, uh, in the uh, I spend Christmas. So the next climb is a double header. Um, I go to Aconcagua in uh, South America, which is the highest mountain uh, in the Western Hemisphere, just under twenty three thousand feet. And I, as a matter of fact, spend Christmas Day on that mountain um, at a at a camp called Camp Canada, ironically, mm. uh, which I think at that point Camp Canada is around sixteen five. Um, so that was a very challenging mountain as well. Uh, my my uh, training partner and myself were the only two people to summit in like a three day span. It was the first time I came across death in the mountain, uh, like n- not my own, uh, like situation. Is, was that it we, that you passed by people no, or that you were actually we there? We got to the summit and there had been a, an Asian climber that had died. And we were at the, the summit. We were the first ones to find him <gasps> at the summit. And, uh, and it was surreal because, I mean, you just, the expressions, I mean, he just, he froze to death. So, and in, you can't explain to people unless you've, I mean, you've been an athlete, so you understand as an athlete, sometimes the level of pushing and even being on Killy, you're pushing your body past a point that you can even understand what your body can handle. So this climber was by himself for whatever reason that was done, which shouldn't have happened. And you could just almost sense that what he did is just probably sat down, is exhausted beyond means, fell asleep and froze to death. And I don't know what the official, to be honest with you, we never, I never followed up afterwards because we didn't take him down. Um, it's a situation where they're, it's still obtainable for teams to come up and get him at this point. So whoever was overseeing or ground company or somebody took care of that later, we just uh, called it in. And we were also in a situation we had to get our ass out of there too uh, because we were in a pretty bad uh, day of, of, of uh, climbing to the point that we got back from that back down to high camp both of us i mean my my uh fellow climber was a really super experienced climber i mean he was uh, by definition my guy but we end up working mm-hmm. together both of us got sick you know right like i literally threw up in my tent which is i had no choice i just couldn't stop it and that was all from the exertion of dealing with uh, the summit and then uh, that morning so we're so tired so exhausted we're trying to eat we're trying to cook our dinner trying to do things and then literally about four hours later, I'm asleep and I start hearing him yelling um, in the dark from his tent. And uh, he's telling me, we've got to go. we got to pack up. we got to leave right now. I mean, we're so tired, so exhausted. It's the middle of the night. But if we don't get down, he's going to lose his feet from frostbite. So we have to go pack up in the middle of the night and get and leave there to get down to base camp. Or if he doesn't start to acclimatize, change his, uh, his climatization, uh, the frostbite will take his feet. This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They're a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally, as I've been using the Extension Marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one-hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. So he's able, because he's, ex- he's, well, he uh, he's, he's he experienced, knows. he knew the signs. Yeah, he knew that there wasn't a matter of waiting it out whatever until morning or whatever. It's like, I know, I know we're hungry, I know we're tired, we know we're exhausted, but if we don't leave now, I'm going to lose my feet. So we've got to go. So, so you pack up yeah. in the pitch black. Yeah. You remember your summit night? Remember getting up in the middle of the night? Remember the snowstorms? Yeah. Doing all that? Imagine doing that, but it's a matter of the other, like you just, you've got it's to. It's life There's or no death. Tr- yeah. Right. Not for me, but I mean, I am his support. Right. So. And then how long does it take? So how is he walking on f- these feet? Are you? He's a, he's <sighs> just a tough, tough guy. Uh, Ecuadorian climber. And uh, he was great. But, uh, but, and then of course, I'm support with him, so I'm I'm working with him to so help him down. You've had these three climbs where there's been one where you're hanging off a cliff. <laughs> then the next one you go to, you come across a come across a, a, a climber who's died. Then almost have your training your your my, guide my, and your my, and your partner 
have to get up in the middle of the night. So there's not not been one that's just been a, I'm going to go for a hike today. No, probably the easiest one was Killy at the very beginning (laughs) that got me started. Yeah, it it was the addictive one and that's... (laughs) And you never knew what was happening. Okay. I know I'm I going through these quickly because yeah. there's then, so much to I get to. And I literally have about another 12 days. So I get back to Argent- back to Mendoza. And I literally, all I do is eat steak every day, drink some wonderful wine, and try to put weight back on. Because in 12 days, I head through Punas Anas in, Ch- in uh, Chile to catch a flight to Antarctica and to climb there. Is there any part in this that you get to take in your environment, that you get to know the people, that you're oh, yeah, realizing you that you're in all of these different places around the world? I mean, can you stop and appreciate where you are? I do. I think I do. I think I do at the time because I live in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really focused on exactly what I'm doing at the time. I mean, I, I enjoyed my, you know, when I was in Mendoza, and I'm, I'm by myself. So, I mean, I literally, I got to occupy my day. So I did wine tours. I Eight and restaurants. Steak. I, you know, I got massages to try to, uh, you know, like just to get my body limbered up again and get ready. Um, and then, boom, I'm I'm off to join a new team in in, in Punta Arenas, and uh, it's the most southern tip in Chile. But then I learned that trip was all about patience. There was three or four times we'd head to the airport, all packed up, ready to go, just to be ter- told to turn around and head back to the hotel and book back in again because the flight's not leaving. If they can't leave, it's about a six hour flight across the, the straits. If they can't leave and get back safely, they won't leave. So we never knew, we never know. And then that just begins that because once we're on what they refer to as the ice, Antarctica is the ice. Once you're on the ice, everything was a waiting game. We waited to get to the next camp. And then once we got to the next camp and we climbed and we summited, we came back, we had to wait again days and days. And you just never know how you're gonna get a flight out. So, so it's patience. Oh, it's a lot of patience in Antarctica. Resilience? Like, it's freezing cold. Like, it's it's resilience. But I have funny stories and, and situations and, uh, and interesting people. That particular climb, at the time in the history books, uh, on my team, I had uh, the youngest person to ever do the Seven Summits. That final climb put him in the record books, which again got broke later, mm-hmm. which I met... I was on the same year I climbed Everest. I was with the same kid that broke that record. Uh, not with him on his team, but at the time period. It was the same year, same season. Um, the first woman from uh, Saudi Arabia to uh, climb uh, Antarctica was part of my team. You know, like So we all, like five of us kind of thing. We don't even have a picture. We have one picture of that summit. Only one because it was so cold that we could... No one was going to take the, like it was so cold. No one wanted to take the glove 50. off to take a photo. You know, you tell people well. here that, that, you know, us, our, us Canadians were proud of being mm-hmm. able to handle our cold. But the reality is at minus 50, people, oh, I might go up minus 40 all the time. Yeah, but we go from our warm car to our house. It's not the same as living in it, sleeping in it, moving in it. Like it's, it's brutally cold, you know. Um, so we have was, refuge. Yeah, we can yeah. handle it for two seconds to yeah. run out and, and, and But at the same it. time, you know, here I am later on down at base camp playing like cards with some of the best climbers in the history books you know i can remember us playing around like it's it's i can't explain these tents but it's like large communal tents that we're, we're hanging out in and we're literally climbing the framing as a joke as a sort of a game that we're trying to almost like rock climb the framing in the in the uh the tents like it was pretty surreal uh landing on the ice i mean we land it takes almost 10 minutes to stop the plane it's on blue ice you get off, they warn you, watch your step. And literally half the people are slipping and falling, right, as soon as you get off the plane. You're in an Elusha, like a Russian uh, cargo plane. You can't even see anything because you're getting out of the belly of the plane. Like, all that is neat experiences. But there's so much happening constantly that you're just on a constant stimuli. It's almost like you have to go back and remember. Even telling you these stories, it helps me kind of remember mm-hmm. little things, you know. But I have to say, people ask me, I began about the mountains, I have to admit that, Antarctica was one of the most beautiful places on earth because you look out over stuff that you know no human beings even step foot on. Like eyes, <clears throat> human eyes haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, some have seen it, even if they've mm-hmm. seen it. But you know, you can look at, across and just know that if you were to walk, you know, five miles in that direction, you've la- you've stepped on land that no one's ever stepped on. You know, like we, you know, one of the the, the 
interesting things about climbing is always if, if there's anything I kind of regret I didn't do was take pictures of every toilet that I every situation <laughs> and made myself like a little handbook for the the you know like your desktop. Sean handbook. Shat here. Oh my God! There's one Sean, time Sean in Antarctica. Here. Yeah. It's like a it's like a a U shape sort of you know three walls you know situation where you're sitting on ice and you you know in makeshift toilets. I'm literally sitting there going to the bathroom, and all of a sudden. I don't know where the plane comes in to the camp, lands, and it lands in such a direction. It's coming right at me, literally turns, <laughs> stops, and I'm sitting there on the shitter, and these people are all getting off the plane. I'm like, all I could do is just wave. There's nothing else you could do. And so those are stories that are like fun, and you yeah. just kind of go, wow, you know, yeah. that's just what it is. You just, you, you lose, you don't think about that kind yeah. of stuff anymore. Anyone you know, who so. is getting off that plane has been in that experience. If, <laughs> yes. they're, if they're getting they're off that plane, get, They're yes. about to go through the experience yeah. that I just finished. Yeah. But I mean, Antarctica, the reason that sparked that thought was because, for an example, you know, things that aren't the glorious things, but you have to think about, like anything you, same as Denali, um, when you go to the bathroom, it's going into a bag and it's coming back off the mountain with you. You pee, you pee in a pee bottle and there's designated spots that pee bottle can be emptied because you're literally dealing with an Arctic desert. And we're trying to preserve that because nothing's going to change. So if we destroy it, it's not going to repair in our time. So we as climbers, as part of um, what we're doing is to preserve what we are. So those are all the little things that you're also learning, but also the, that much more of a challenge to you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're dealing with all that, but you still got to deal with what you got to deal with. Which is a very different mindset to what's happened to Everest and base camps and the overpopulation and the trash. Like, I mean, I, it's been devastating oh, yeah. to read some of the, the articles um, you know, as to the changes that have happened, you know, a lot of people aren't going to the Antarctic, but a lot more people are trying to get to base camps. And so it's changed, yeah, exactly. it's changed the dynamics of the mountains, uh, a lot. You, you, you've been in the purest places, I would say. And that's what you sense is you yeah. get that purest place. Even with Everest too, after, you know, when you're actually climbing the mountain versus getting to base camp, as soon as you start to go past that Kumbo icefall, you're getting into... You know, you're, where limited people on mm -hmm. Earth have ever seen, so it's it's a whole new game. You know? Oh, okay. So uh, you're definitely gonna miss your appointment, by the way, because we're only like three, <laughs> four, five minutes, and then <laughs> we're no, we're doing, we're doing okay. So uh, you've got, you've come back from Antarctica. You still have how many more to go? Three more. Four. Well, and you still have effort, done, and you I've have done, to do Everest. This, at this point, I've only done three. Okay. So I got still four more four to go. Four to go. Mm -hmm. And I where is back. Everest in this? Actually, that's where Everest is. Okay. Now uh, it's time to, to challenge Everest. Because um, I get back at the end of uh, January from Antarctica. And then I have to leave at the beginning of, uh, or the end of March to head back, to head to Nepal. I'm just going to side note. You've got really good bar managers and retail staff oh. at this point who are running your businesses oh, for you. Yeah. We I should mean, we should we should point that out. Somehow they all seem to stay running and smooth. <laughs> yeah. So you and, can and good partners yes. with me at that point in time. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of my businesses was uh, Grace O'Malley's that I was involved with uh, with my partnership and the management team was amazing there and again, it allowed you to be able to, you know, continue so um, I mean, I always say to people too, I mean, when we got in, when we took further into the charity, uh, the harder charity aspects of it, it's like, you really want to support me? Just help me with my businesses, yeah. support my businesses, because in turn, what you're really doing is allowing me to do what I'm doing as a forefront. Yeah. Because my original goal with Tree Mountains was started off was if I was going to take on this challenge um, and you know, the likelihood that something could happen, you know, uh, somewhere along the line, it's got to be greater than myself. I mean, I want to challenge myself, but I've got to, there's got to be something else behind this. Um, otherwise, it would be just, I don't know how to say this, and I don't mean to be to anybody else that's done it, but it's too self-centered to do it only for that. And all the expectations on my team, on my expectations of my family, my friends, everything, and not make it something greater than myself. And that's where Dream Mountains came from. But Dream Mountains didn't start until after you'd done the Seven Summits. No, no, it started then. Is it started uh, as you went to Everest? Yeah, I said. Okay, a, so so I set a goal to raise a dollar for every foot that I had uh, that I would climb, which turned out to be about one hundred and forty-five thousand dollars, one hundred forty-five thousand feet. So over that two years, um, I was self-funding my own climbing. I, there was no sponsorship. I had some help, like uh, 
I had satellite phone companies that supported me and I had things like that. But generally, for the most part, everything was on my own. Um, at the same time, I ran fundraisers. Uh, I was doing things to, to, to raise money uh, for the charities, the seven charities at the time. And uh, that's what that was became the root of Dream Mountains. Okay. The early stages before I met you guys mm-hmm. and before, uh, um, you know, people got involved behind the scenes of what was going on. It was later when I got, when I was finished all of it, people go, wow, now what? Now what? Like, what's next? Like, why does it have to be something next? I mean, I just did this up in summer. It's like, why do I have to do something more? And um, and that's where the, the dream teams came involved. Mm-hmm. And that's where the idea came uh, to came start from. the dream teams, to keep it going, keep the momentum. Because the charities now had, you know, woke they up were, and said, they were hey, benefiting wow, okay, from something this. was going on yes. here. Like, at first we were just like, yeah, sure, if you want to raise some money for us, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. You know, now it's at the point, you know, seven years later, it's like, Whoa, <laughs> what are you going to do? Like, how are we going to keep this going? So... Everest. Yeah, Everest. A lot of people don't realize Everest is two and a half months. And uh, patience. Um, just, you know, friends that were close to me at the time, like my, uh, some of my closest friends uh, that I would uh, talk to on satellite phone would say they could hear the loneliness. I was with a team uh, that was actually from uh, Argentina. So to be there, um, the team that I climbed with were world class. And that's exactly where I wanted to be. And to be on that team, you had to be invited. So I was the only, well, the only Canadian, but I was pretty much the only North American uh, on the team. Everybody was from Argentina, except for one woman who was the, who on my team became the first uh, Guatemalan woman to climb Everest. Uh, my team, my, by the way, my, my tent mate in Denali was the first woman from, uh, uh, I was going to say Scandinavian, but uh, Denmark. First uh, woman from Denmark to climb the seven summits. So again, all these, like I'm really part of a world-class elite mm-hmm. thing, not even realizing really I am. Like, I'm just going along my, my tour and this is what's happening, right? Um, but so the problem is everybody in my team spoke Spanish. And, uh, and I, I do speak Spanish. I, I do have some Spanish, uh, but not strong enough and not mountain Spanish, like, which became a bit of an issue. Sometimes on the mountain, it became an issue too, because your first instinct is to speak in your mother tongue. So when you're yelling bullets or bombs, which is one of our expressions up on the mountain, uh, bullets are basically telling you that you got you know, uh, quarter size, loony size uh, uh, ice pellets coming down. Bombs are sizes like a, a ball, you know, a baseball that are going to come down. Those ones are telling you, get your head in, keep tight, don't even look up, don't even think about it. Just you heard bombs, so stay tight. But but the first instincts come in Spanish. So by the time I'm kind of figuring if I even heard something right, I'm already dealing with it. So... But then there'd be other things like, like my guides would speak and like we would have our team meetings at night uh, to prep for where we're going to go, what we're going to do the next day or something. And they were good. They'd do it in English for me, really, just for me. And then uh, but then something might change. Things change all the time. You even remember things changing mm-hmm. all the time on, on Killy. So then I might listen from my tent and hear something and like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Are we now getting up at two in the morning instead of three in the morning? Whoa, what's happening here? You know, and that kind of stuff happens. And it just adds stress to the scenario because you're already stressed that you're about to go in the Kumbo Icefall at three o'clock in the morning because you always want to avoid all the sunlight and, uh, and, the, and the avalanches. So, and every time you go in that Kumbo Icefall, you know you're risking your life. So that's already in the back of your mind. And then all of a sudden, just little things change and, and you're just, you're never really sure as you're going along and you're always challenging your skills, your abilities, your, your drive. Um, Everest, I mean, you talked about getting sick. I got sick the very first day on, on, on going to base camp, like, like at the beginning, I had gotten a, a gastro uh, infection um, from that I had brought from Kathmandu. So for the first two or three days, I was deathly ill and I, same thing that, you know, I was giving it all up and uh, nothing was staying in. I was losing weight already. And, you know, for somebody that's done Everest Base Camp with me, they'll know Everest Base Camp alone is kind of, you know, it's got his difficulties, it's got whatever. 
But the difference is, you know, within 10 days, you're going to be back to safe and you're good. <laughs> this is the beginning of two and a half months. This is not going to get any easier. So your brain is thinking that. And somewhere along the line, you've got to process that and go, look, get out of this headspace. You've got to find a more positive way of thinking about this because you're not even to base. You're not even to the bottom of the starting of this. And um, so, you know, I, I, I did get a little stronger, but eventually um, I went to a med camp. I went to, uh, to see a doctor at base and um, I got part of a trial that they were doing uh, and it was like a kind of a steroid thing for the lungs uh, trial and um, and what I had ended up picking up because my immune system was so low I ended up picking up what was called the you know, Kumbo cough in uh, base camp and it's like bronchitis on steroids it was unbelievable there's one other guy for an example at base camp that had broke his ribs from coughing so hard nothing every time I would eat I would start to cough. You know how we have that natural gag reflex that stops us from getting sick? It just was not happening anymore. So as soon as I would cough, I would get sick. So now anything I'm eating, I can't maintain weight. I can't maintain strength. So I had to figure something out with this. And luckily, and you know, it was a placebo versus the steroid. I don't care. I know for sure I had to get the steroid because there's no way I got out of that in a placebo situation. I've even kept that in my, I've kept that little container and stuff as one of my momentums of what happened but I noticed it because I'm climbing with people that I know I'm as strong as I know I'm as good as but I'm not performing the same way in the first like couple weeks after uh, the steroid took effect I was holding my own and I didn't want to hold people back and I didn't want to risk other people's lives on the mountain because I wasn't going to be able to maintain uh, my positioning so I did start getting stronger and I could see it I could feel it uh, each time we would go up and acclimatize higher I realized, okay, this is good. All right. And then the nice thing about it, it's kind of like a team that's down in a game, but then starts to come back. Their momentum's actually stronger than the team that's losing ground. So I actually felt like, okay, I got this. I can do this. Stop. Just go all the way through this. And then by the time we actually had to do our final push, um, I knew I was ready to do it. Or at least I was in the best spot I could be to do it. So, yeah. What is it like to be at the summit? Because you're not up there very long. It's almost oh, like you gee, get I there. <laughs> <laughs> you're not sitting there and enjoying the view for very long. No, it's, I mean you're there for. I think I, I think my I don't I think my summit period of time was maybe ten fifteen minutes at max. You know, you're uh, and for a moment or two. I mean, for maybe two or three minutes, I'm the highest human being on earth. Um, like I mentioned, uh, my uh, dad passed away when I was twenty four, and. Uh, I'm not a religious person, but just as I was just getting to the tip of the Hillary step and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm close to summit. I'm like maybe 10 minutes from summit, which is, is a long way close, close. You could see it, but it mm -hmm. takes a long way to get that 10 minutes. Um, my, uh, I just teared up and, uh, you know, other than going through some of these things, I don't normally, I'm not a crier and I, I teared up and I couldn't stop it. And it, it literally felt, it, it felt like heavenly. It felt like my dad was there. So <laughs> it was weird, but, but it was really cool at the same time. You know? So I'm sure you can understand. And, um, <clears throat> but it was, it was neat. And it gave me that strength. It gave me that push and then, uh, you know, and uh, get to the top and then turn around and, but now the whole point is you got to get down. You know, the whole point is uh, you're not safe at any point. You still got, you literally got two days to get to uh, safety at this point. More people die on the way down from every single day. I, th the I think people don't realize that is, oh, is, yeah. is the death toll. And were there people on that, on that trip that, that um, ran into that? Not, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, not on my team. Um, uh, my team was good. We had, we lost one. We didn't, lose uh death wise a person but one of our team members who's actually the president of um uh espn uh, north uh, south america was on our team and he um he got some really uh gall gallstones gall uh, gallstones and camp too and had to be mm -hmm. flown out yeah. and uh poor guy he was just in pain but to his credit uh i stayed in touch with him uh a year later he came back and uh mm -hmm. summited um so you know, that was, that's drive to get all that way and then have to let it go. Sean, I don't think you realize that it takes such a, a certain person and personality to do the things that, that you guys are doing. So 
uh, you know, it, 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 it kind of gets there. Okay, so <laughs> do, we, do we want to text the person mm. that you're supposed to be meeting in, in, in oh, a couple minutes? No, no, it's good. It's good. We're okay? Yep. I'm going to, okay, I'm going to just, yeah. I'm going to pause yeah. us for one second and, and see how we're going here. I know, but we're like, we, we are literally like, we what? Along. We can move it along if you like it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we haven't even gone to Dream Mountains. Let's let's skip ahead. So, I mean, I can summarize most yeah. of the, I mean, okay. you know, from the Seven Summit okay, hold perspective. Okay, hold on, hold on, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, from the Seven Summit perspective, so Everest gets done, um, I'm home safe, um, I'm successful. So, again, just to help, um, you know, your listeners understand you're, you know, you got to get to base camp, which is 17.5. That takes about 10 days. Then you spend the next two months uh, primarily acclimatizing at 17.5, uh, which you can again understand at 19.5 is the summit, but you're living there for two months. But you go up, you keep trying to get a little higher, um, and eventually we hit 24,000 feet, which is camp three. We sleep there one night, we come back down. Now we've acclimatized to the best that our bodies can. We wait for the actual window of opportunity. So that could be a couple of weeks or a week, whenever basically the the scientists and everybody says, all Let's right, this go. is your best shot. You got one shot at it, go. From there, it's four days to the summit and two days back down to base. So it's a six day run. Um, just to give people an understanding really what it means, it's from high camp, which is 26,000 feet. At that point, you're gonna go into what's called the dead zone. It's not because technically that's where people die the most, but it's also because it's where um, statistically your body can no longer regenerate itself. Your 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 uh, blood cells are no longer regenerating, so that's why they nickname it the dead uh, dead zone. So that's where oxygen is coming into play. The oxygen is pretty much just tricking your body into believing that you're at a certain level. Um, without the oxygen, then uh, you know some you, you can still do it without oxygen, but there's no, I don't, I don't understand why a human being would do it because it is for sure uh, medically starting to adjust your mm -hmm. brain and you're going to lose <laughs> brain cells from it. So anyway, so at that point, you're, uh, we do a, a push from high camp, uh, left at nine o'clock at night um, and climbed for 12 hours to summit, just to the summit alone, and then another six hours down. So it's 18 hours at... Uh, you know, minus 40 degrees, you're at between 26 and 29,000 feet. And just for people to understand, I mean, imagine putting on your, your best running shoes on a beautiful day and just taking a straight 18-hour walk on a nice open road. Now, do that at altitude with 80 pounds over and above your body weight on you. Um, there's no way you can maintain enough water or food to carry in to be able to do that. So you're, you're pushing your body just beyond. So after that, there's pretty much not too much that you think in your life that you can't you handle. <laughs> yeah, you know, so you just got to tap in and remember what you did as a human being. Um, based on time, we know that you do the seven. Mm -hmm. You go back to Kelly, but now you've created Dream Mountains. So, right. which was the first? So, Kilimanjaro, in order to be in the record books, I didn't even know I was in the record books. We had a, a New York, uh, a New York. Um, a Times writer that followed us on Killy, and she was with us for uh, the, the most of the trip. And uh, she just wanted to, she was writing about the whole experience. And in there, sometimes she's she's going through each climber, different stories, different lies. And when she comes across mine, she actually comes in one night uh, into the in the mess tent, and she goes, "You know, I've been doing some research on you and on what you're doing." And then she goes, "Do you realize if you do this on the time frame you're doing, you're going to be at that point, she goes, you're going to be in the top ten uh, people in history never do it this fast. And I actually had no idea until that moment. I had no idea. It wasn't even the goal. That wasn't the point. Mm -hmm. I was doing it because this made most sense to keep moving. And, um, so then we started to, when I got home, I started to look at that. Well, okay. The timing, um, it screwed up things because Indonesia, uh, I couldn't climb because there was a coup, a government coup <laughs> that threw it off. And it was another, crazy thing so it was supposed to be before Killy uh, and Killy was supposed to be the first dream team I was leading a, a team of 21 people to Killy um, first time I'd ever done it it was a huge experience and it was going to be the final seven 
It turned out it couldn't be because I had to reroute this. So I did the Killy, and literally when I finished Killy with this whole team experience and and these you know, 21 I, lives, 21 changed. lives yeah. changed. They all come home. They're all celebrating. They're all just like, wow, our lives, whatever. I literally had nine days, turned around, flew right back to Indonesia to climb again. <laughs> I was just like, whoa, oh my Jesus. God. And then that was a double header because I did Indonesia and then Australia because there's two versions of the seven summits, so geographical, geological. So I knocked them off, off at the same time. And it was just a brutal climb too because it's a week in the jungle and week out. Anyways, that's all done back home, and now the seven summits are done, and um, and the first dream team is in the record books. And I think the first dream team, you know, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think we raised uh, up and around $100,000 for the seven charities and started the whole next seven years of, uh, you know, an alumni of over 100 and some people, so... I'm proud to be an alumni. Oh, I'm... I'm really proud. I did 20. I'm proud of every one of our I alumni. I did the Kilimanjaro. Uh, 2014, I did Kelly. Yep. Uh, great team. Great, great team. experience. Yes. How much over the seven years did we're, Dream? How much has Dream Mountains raised? So we're uh, just uh, we're just uh, I think we're right at 1.3 million that we've raised. So which is incredible. I mean, you know, when you think that you know a hundred people in our community um, have together worked together you know, uh, and under one cause uh, for seven amazing charities have raised that much money. I mean, every year it's on an average around maybe 100,000. Mm -hmm. I think that our our biggest was maybe 165,000. But that's I think done we were 130 just, the year I did it. Yeah, but if still each year, but yeah. we learned as a team. Yeah, how to do is, it. We learned and got better at it and we figured out more ways on how to help each other and the alumni started helping mm -hmm. the alumni. Yes. You know, so, and in your position, for an example, uh, with the media. Oh, I got uh, everyone hooked in that exactly. building. Exactly, <laughs> and, 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 and that got everybody yeah. evolved mm -hmm. and then the generations and you kind of kicked that off so everybody gets to sort of learn from that too. I, there's uh, seven charities, but there have been uh, slight changes uh, over yeah, the years, there's been, and there's yeah. been some that have kind of moved on, and then new ones that have come in. I did mine for the SOS Children's Village, which, which was amazing because then we got to actually experience it when we finished coming down, Kayla. We actually had a chance uh, mm -hmm. to go out, and it made it so much more meaningful. One of these days, I'm going to have to get in full on kind of what my experience was like. Um, I'm totally yeah, reflecting, and I should have I should have had like a three hour <laughs> podcast saved on for you on this one. The fact, though, and I just want to talk briefly on because it's people and how you read people and relationships because we would be doing these training sessions. One of the things we had to do was the stair climbs, the uh, stair training, mm -hmm. which I thought I was in shape. And I came to you oh, in I shape. Oh, I remember our, our, you and I as our personal that, day. I remember that one four yeah. sets. I remember right, exactly. So the first workout was one of those. So it was Minto Suites Hotel, 33 floors. We had to go up and down four times. That was the base workout to kind of get it in. And Just by the time we off. left for Killy, we had to be able to do the 10 times the 33 flights up and down. And you and you had like a time frame that you wanted to do it in. I ended up being able to, like I could rock yeah. it out. Oh, yeah. But the first time we did it, I had never, I'd always done at the gym like stair training. Like, but that was always going up and i remember i keep telling you listen i'm setting this pace you decide and yeah you're like no i can keep it i can keep it and it was just my base training pace oh my god and, and you're like no i'm good and you were you're right there but it's and i warned you within down. two days later you'd be sore and, you, and then i remember the next day you called me and you're like no i'm, I'm not too bad I'm, i, I, I feel this move. a little bit two days later I all was of a sudden not the moving. profanity started three days later you couldn't even move in the building at work <laughs> i couldn't i had never trained the muscles to go down everything we do was to i always stair climbed up mm -hmm. right climb, but i was never training it to go down which i'm so grateful for because i actually found the tough like aside from vomiting every a couple minutes <laughs> climbing up the mountain and the our and our was amazing yeah. our conditioning was amazing because coming down that was a 16 hour day oh. for us when you talked about how long these days were and how grateful i was that we had had the downhill because i couldn't feel my legs or my knees or anything yeah. by the end of that all you can think of was that hot shower <laughs> oh my gosh i i do i hope you know what i think we'll come back and do kind of what this experience was yeah. like but i do want to hit on if you don't mind when we would do these hikes we were kind of thinking it was for us to learn how to do our layering mm. um how to kind of know when we were hot and how to kind of bring on that's layers or take off like so that's what it was for us i realized that for you you were studying us yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. That's what you were doing. Mm -hmm. We we were we were learning our gear. You were studying. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out because in the mountain you're not you're 
you're not going to want to tell me what you what how you're really feeling. Um, you're gonna have, people are gonna have a hard time. They're dealing with social pressure. They're dealing with challenging themselves. They're dealing with the altitude. So really, I want to try to understand who are you at ground, and then who are you going to be up higher. And I can I can never really say how it's going to turn out. But what I want to be able is to help you and be able to protect everybody. So I got to be able to understand. You know, for an example, if somebody's extremely chatty down in a wolf trail and they're always chatting, always chatting, and da 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 but when we get up to the mountain and it's a certain day and that same person isn't saying a word, I don't need to ask them how they're doing. That's already telling me what's happening. But then I got to watch everything. I got to watch what you're eating at dinner. Uh, I'm paying attention to it. Even though everybody's doing their stuff, I'm watching every climber, breaking them down, trying to figure out how they're doing um, with all the goal of trying to make sure that they have a, a successful, happy, healthy, you know, successful summit. And I think that's one, one of the nice things about the Dream Mountains versus people that just make, you know, these trips on their own without having any charitable aspect, without any real training. It's about the experience. So that they, and when it's all said and done, they had the best experience possible. But nobody will ever say a Dream Mountains climb was easy because I never chose the right best times. Even the Killy, I chose no, one you of the chose, hardest times to yeah, go. Yeah, it was the but, snow tops that you wanted, the snow covered. Yeah. Yeah, it was the worst. And the less I mean, tourists and less people. It was more It authentic. was a massive snowstorm the night we summited. Like, there, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, there was so much. There was so much to that trip. And I am going to say and it because I think we're going to do it. we had a climber that couldn't make it. We did. And we had to deal with, had to deal yeah. with that in the middle of the night. While everybody else got their own issues, I'm still dealing with a climber that's in major pain. That has to, I have to turn him around and lose his summit, you know, stuff like that. So. And that was a close friend of yours. I, yeah. I, yeah. Who came back to yes. uh, three years later and did the summit? Dream Mountains did Kilimanjaro, Everest Base Camp, and Machu, Machu Picchu. Picchu. So, very yeah. three very different climbs. Um, unfortunately, there have been situations that you've run in, and unfortunately, the team was there uh, for the Nepal earthquake. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was, there's nothing in the guidebook that to teach me and get me ready for that. Um, and I have a, you know, over the years, uh, I've developed, a, or we, like her and I have developed a really great relationship. Um, our, uh, assistant guide, uh, Christy Johnson has been with me. So, you know, she became, she started off as a climber for three of them and then, uh, turned into an assistant guide and followed through the next ones. She was an assistant guide when I went, yeah. she was the assistant yeah. and I will always remember and I give her full credit. She could have easily, she was ready to summit. She was feeling great or anything, but mm -hmm. there were two climbers that didn't quite get to the full point. And yeah. she, she turned, she, she turned around with them to ensure their safety. Yeah, and, exactly. and, and, and I knew that she was strong enough to go oh, she and reach her own summit, enough, yeah. you know, like she was, uh, but, to, but for her to there, turn around a couple hundred meters away from being able to do it, I, I, I found it remarkable. My la yeah, and it's the same like my last Killy, uh, not your year, the next one. Um, I didn't get to the summit because I had to take a climber back down, and that climber had to make a decision. She wanted her husband, who was she was there to be part of his experience, and she didn't want to hold him back. The deal I made him was I will get her down safe, but you have to continue on. And, uh, and with the, he went on actually with the gentleman that couldn't make it three years earlier. The two of them did it. The two oh, of them went special. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's everyone, and I can tell you, everyone has a story so into yeah, there's this. There's so many stories that came from the alumni. And the Nepal thing though, that, that affected that, that there was trauma associated oh, with that. And I, and still, and still PTSD people. that are still occurring from that. It was a very, I yeah. mean, over 10,000 people died of that earthquake. And we were literally in the epicenter of that. We were right in Kathmandu and that hit. Um, our team was safe. I mean, all, you know, we just, luck was in our way. There's so much luck in that team, that, that, that situation, which you just got to believe in fate and believe the Dream Mountains, there's somewhere in there it does good because that team, Christy and I, the night before, the team arrived late and uh, their flights came in a lot later than they're supposed to. Everything got pushed back. The dinner was late to, and they were exhausted and they were supposed to go on a team um, a tour, a city tour the next day. That was going to be from 9 to 12. And uh, I talked to Christy about it. And I said, you know, listen, I, I think I'm going to call this off. I think I'm going to take this whole tour and put it on the back end of the trip instead. Let them sleep. Let them catch up. And then we'll have a team meeting at 2 o'clock. Take them into town, do a little thing. So that's what we did. That earthquake hit. The earthquake hit right at the moment that they would have been in Dunbar Square, which was demolished. 
there's no way about it that that a good portion of that team of our team would have died that's like not getting on the plane that crashes like it was literally that and nothing other than other than a little bit here and there one one person got hit with some uh, bricks and stuff but other than that nobody got hurt and we were in the safest probable place that we could have been that hotel that I'm always animate about was one of the best hotels built um, it was the safest place to be but that doesn't take away from the fact that again you weren't on the plane that crashed so everybody oh. has to deal with all of that and then everybody at home not knowing what's going on we had a, another uh, a co-worker of yours uh, that was a media person and her best way to deal with it was to immediately go into her professional mode mm. and she was fantastic at getting information home I mean her and I, she struggled with me because she kept wanting to interview me and do stuff, and, and I wouldn't do it. I said, listen, my, my, your job is to do that. My job right now is to focus on the team. And uh, I've told home that we're safe. That's all I'm doing. Even my, my girlfriend at the time just kind of, people were calling her and doing stuff, and yeah. she was like, look, she goes, I know Sean. If, he, if there's a problem, he would have told me. But he, I know he's good. He's just focusing on the team right now. Dream Mountain's retired, yep. 1.3 mil, uh, and there's so many individual stories. I think maybe what I'm going to do is is kind of go back and then be able to share some of the Dream Mountain's aspects and the stories. Mm -hmm. This one was about yours uh, and how you were able to accomplish uh, everything. I just, in, in closing, because I... I Oh, I I, and it's so funny. I, I do these podcasts so that I'm never time constrained. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, okay, I got I to gotta wrap this up. What do you tell that 14-year-old kid with this life experience? Is, there, is it the same person? Is it, do you recognize that? You know, we tell her, we, like to, we tell our children, you can be anything you want. You can do anything you want. But the conditions are, you've got to make a decision, though, to learn, to be focused, to be disciplined. And I think all of us touch that child as they grow and they learn somewhere in there. I mean, I can remember my grandfather giving me lessons on how to sweep the barn, you know, and uh, and things that I, I still use now with my young staff and how to, do, if you're going to do something, do it right or just don't do it. You, you have to make a decision whether those things, you just listen to them or you really let them go to heart and become part of your nature. And I think that's the difference between, you know, levels of success that people enjoy or experience or, you know, uh, and then how they're going to take those life lessons and, and take them forward. So, um, and then now going forward, I, I now, I, I'm an amateur, but I'm ranked in the top 100 in the United States now in uh, stair racing. And that's what I'm doing now. And my plan for Dream Mountains is to continue it when we build that 65-story building in Ottawa to have the very first you know, stair uh, race competition fundraiser and start a whole new generation of Dream Mountains. Uh, but I don't have to be in the mountains now. <laughs> okay, sign me up for that. Okay. I'll, get, I'll go back to my stair training. Good girl. Because I did love it. I did love it. Uh, visit uh, Sean. Fat, you know what? People are going to want to ask me more questions. Go into Fat Boys. Yeah, go see me at <laughs> go, Fat Boys. Go order, go order like the cornbread there. Oh, my gosh. And uh, and just ask more questions. Or dreammountains.com if you want to learn the history and see all the, the climbs and what people did. Yeah, I... I I have incredibly fond memories. It was the life. It was a lifetime experience that I'm truly grateful for. I really am. Um, and we're going to do a part two on this because I think there's so much more to go. But I do have to wrap that up. This is episode 40 of Living Your Life with Leanne Lang. Congratulations. Episode Thanks, Sean. Episode, can you pray? Right? I know. Crazy things that we achieve in our lives. You're 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 doing exactly what we're talking about right now. Thank you. Yeah, you're following your. Dream. I learned a lot of that on the mountain. Yeah, you figured you, out who you, I was. Well, yeah, you can't hide from yourself in the mountain. No. You know, one of my favorite sayings. Even when I was vomiting my guts out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please remember to like, subscribe, uh, let people know about the podcast. We're trying to share it uh, and to be able to get people on board and know that uh, everyone's got a story uh, that can inspire change and can inspire other people. Thanks, Sean. It was great. <laughs>